Hello, it's Scott Manley here with an update on the SpaceX CRS-7 launch failure. So, uh, Monday, Elon Musk basically held a conference call to explain the status of the investigation and the preliminary, which are preliminary findings, which they pretty much think are the reason behind what happened, but they're not willing to say 100% just yet. Now, I want to go over them with because it kind of... Uh, it gives us an insight into some of the parts of rocket science, which we usually gloss over. Now, if you don't remember exactly what happened, there was a problem in the second stage of the rocket where the liquid oxygen tank had an overpressure event and essentially ruptured, exploded, and the rocket then disintegrated. Actually, the first stage was firing at the time and it continued on oblivious to the fact for a good few seconds. The second stage was not firing and that's where the problem was. So I'm going to use some visual aids here, which I've put together using Microsoft Paint. Uh, yes, yeah, so nothing, no fancy computer graphics here, just my little uh, little line drawings here. So this is an example of uh, the upper stage or the second stage. This is a simple diagram that tends to get used. And you have two tanks, the liquid oxygen, which is your oxidizer, and the RP-1, rocket propellant one. It's essentially kerosene. That is your fuel. These things get mixed together in the engine and the whole thing goes. The, these were obviously not getting mixed together at this time because the stage wasn't active. Now, I'll just point out that I put the liquid oxygen in front and the RP-1 behind for no other reason than it's quite common to see that configuration. I don't actually know and I haven't found any uh, site or any document which explains what order these things were arranged. However, we did find out during today's call, or rather we uh, it was revealed... Uh, to many people who didn't already know it, that that oxygen tank contains liquid helium, not liquid helium tanks, it contains helium tanks, right? These are little tanks containing uh, helium that are used to pressurize the tanks. So normally, the, when the fuel is being drained out of the tanks, the space at the top of the tank gets bigger, and so you want to fill that in with some gas to make sure that there's always pressure pull, pushing the fuel or the oxidizer out. Helium is used because it's extra light, it expands a lot when you heat it up, and uh, it's totally inert. It's not going to react with your oxidizer or your propellant or your fuel tank, for that matter, which is many good things. These are stored in something called, um, what is it? Composite Overlaid Pressure Vessels, COPVs, and that's a name which uh, comes from, like, I don't know, the Space Shuttle era. What it is, it's a very lightweight uh, tank in the middle, and then you wrap that around with carbon fiber to provide extra strength, and there's some pictures of them here. Without the carbon fiber, when you pressurize that tank, it would rupture, but uh, that carbon fiber and everything allows the whole thing to withstand the pressure and perform its job. Now, these are put underneath the liquid oxygen. And I will guess that that's because by keeping the tank cool, it means you can put more helium into it simply because of your standard gas gas law, right? Well, anyway, a side effect of this is because they're sitting inside this tank, they want to move upwards, right? They will... They're buoyant, right? They're gas, essentially, and helium, guess what? He helium in gas form is lighter than liquid oxygen, or oxygen in liquid form. So there's, it's like holding a football underwater. It wants to pop up. These things are held in place with struts. These are basically metal rods with some attachment gear on either end, right? And there's a photo which kind of gets you an idea of what these struts are like. It shows Elon Musk standing in front of one of the fuel tanks. And you can see these this kind of star-shaped pattern showing the struts joining things to the side there. Now, that isn't the second stage tank, but it is, uh, it is the first stage tank. And so it should have a similar design. And as I understand it, it has a similar design. Anyway... What we have is these tanks, these things wanting to go up, so you have a couple of struts holding them in position. Now, because they're being held down, what's, what's actually pushing them up is the tendency for liquid oxygen to sink down because it's heavier. So as the rocket accelerates faster and faster, the forces pushing these things upwards or pushing the oxygen downwards get higher and higher. And... What then happens during the launch is around 3.2 Gs, the forces get sufficient that one of those struts broke. And that 
was a bit disastrous, let's see. <laughs> that was basically where everything started to go wrong, and everything went wrong in something like 893 milliseconds. So, that strut was uh, subject to 2,000 pounds of force, which sounds like a lot, but the strut was actually designed for 10,000 pounds of force. Uh, the struts are not built by SpaceX, they just buy them in. They bought in the pressure vessels as well, I presume. They're just kind of the components that you buy off the shelf, and the manufacturer will give you these things, and they have a spec sheet, and they say, this is what it should do. Well, SpaceX team went and they tried to look at this situation, they debugged it or whatever, they tested a bunch of these struts, and they found that some of these struts were in fact failing at 20% of their certified value. So they're not going to be using that supplier anymore, I suspect. And moreover, they will probably be testing all struts before they go into their launch vehicles. Anyway, once that strut failed, the tank, the little helium tank, flew forwards, smashed into the front of the pressure vessel. That isn't what broke it. What broke it was the fact that it had essentially been detached from its, its hose that was carrying the helium to the manifold that would control the slow release of the gas. No, the gas was just getting released as quickly as possible and filling whatever space it had. And it didn't have much space. It had 98% uh, of the tank was full of liquid oxygen, which is pretty much incompressible. So it filled the remaining 2%. And within less than a second, the pressure in the vessel had gone past what it was rated for, and it broke, and that was when we saw the failure of the launch vehicle actually happen. So that's essentially what happened, and the whole thing happened so quickly. What I find really kind of interesting about this is they revealed during the meeting that, or during the conference, that the way they figured out the locations of these failures was through the accelerometers which were placed on the vehicle. Now, when you have a large vehicle and it's being accelerated by rockets, you know, it has all sorts of weird wobbly bits and things like that. And you want to track these vibration profiles. So you have accelerometers all over it that are providing telemetry. Now, if they're providing data at a high enough rate, they will actually pick up acoustic waves. And uh, when something snaps, that generates an acoustic wave. When something smashes into the front of the tank, that is an acoustic wave. Those events, those waves, propagate it out at the speed of sound through oxygen or whatever and would generate uh, effects on those accelerometers. And since the accel accelerometers were spread around the vehicle, they were able to locate the actual locations of these events. And that's how they did it. I mean, it's, it's cool. Like, a, these accelerometers aren't designed to detect sound, but they were able to do that to, to within sufficient precision that they're pretty sure that it was one of those struts that actually failed. And I will point out that during the question and answer session, somebody did ask if this problem could have been solved with more struts. Anyway... Moving on, uh, the other thing that came out of this was that the Dragon vehicle actually safely uh, separated and survived the failure of the launch vehicle and continued to provide telemetry all the way down until it fell below the horizon, followed shortly by smashing into the ocean at far too fast for it to uh, survive. Uh, they said, or Elon Musk thinks, that it would have survived had there been software on board to recognize this situation and perform you know, parachutes and everything, fire all those. And that software will be available on future Dragon flights. It's the same software that you would have for the Dragon 2 flight, but the uh, Dragon 2 spacecraft, but they'll be using it on the Dragon 1. So that makes complete sense. But hey, hope they never have to actually use it again. So yeah, that is the update on that. I hope you all found that interesting. Um, obviously, disclaimer, I'm not a rocket scientist. I merely play one on the internet. I do have qualifications in astronomy and physics. I'm a smart person, but I do not work in rocket science by trade. But uh, I, I think we're pretty close to the result here, and I'm sure I will have a bunch of people telling me that I over oversimplified things or got something wrong. But anyway, I look forward to your comments. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.